Hey everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV in episode number eight of Van Halen Stories. Today my guest is Ryan Cook from the Ace Freely and Gene Simmons solo bands. He's also a member of the Rock and Roll Residency in Nashville, Tennessee. Kind of an open jam for uh, for a lot of famous people too. You know, you've had a lot of people come through there and that's one of the things that I was really amazed by. Is I, was, I was in there, you know, and Lizzie Hale's there and, you know, I talked to her and Joe uh, Ottinger and, and yeah. all those people. And B.B. B- 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 Buell I met there, you know, and a lot, a lot of really cool people that, that have great histories in rock and roll. So you guys kind of started that whole thing. I mean, you're, you're, you know, this new article, there's actually a new article out about you guys in Guitar Player Magazine. And the, right. the, the title of it basically is How Three Kiss Fans Became the Backing Band for Ace Freely and Gene Simmons. Which is which is awesome. I mean, I know for everybody, any any guitar player being in a guitar magazine like Guitar Player or Guitar World is like the the, the ultimate, right? You guys, that's pretty cool, right? It's fantastic. Um, you know, I, I can tell you without exaggerating. Every month, growing up as a kid, I read those magazines: Guitar Player, Guitar World, Guitar for the Practicing Musician, all, right. all of them. As I'm sure you did. Oh yeah, I did. You know, yeah. You know, for so sure. our story is very similar. Uh, and almost probably exactly the same in that respect. Me and you and the millions of other guitar players that read those magazines. Um, I'll tell you, it's pretty neat to go to the newsstand and see yourself in one, though. When- <laughs> right, right. right. I, you know what? I, when Damon was first featured in, in uh, Damon Johnson was first featured in Guitar World or whatever, I just thought that was the coolest thing. You know? It's like, oh. dude, you made it now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what else you did, but you made guitar roll, bro. <laughs> Nothing else matters. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, as a guitar player. But your 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 story—it's a really cool. We'll get into that kind of that little bit of that story sure. a little later. But um, yeah. you know, let's talk about a little bit about how you got into guitar. And you know, all of us, it seems anyway, are we have a gateway into Van Halen, which is always seems like Kiss <laughs> because it we is. All, we all kind of came of age at that time, and then you know, then you we saw Ace Freely, you know, and so uh, tell me how you got into guitar first, sure. and then Kiss, then Van Halen. Of course, uh, I started at a really young age, and I, I'm a '70s kid. I was actually born in December of 1969, okay. so I was, you know, just less than two weeks short of being born actually in the 70s, but it was late 1969. Uh, so I have a sister who's five years older. So you can imagine growing up in the 70s, um, having a sister or a sibling that's five years older than you. Uh, I got a lot of albums by default just because my sister had them first, right? Sure. So I'm talking about Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, Van Halen. Uh, actually, not Van Halen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, it was Aerosmith, Zeppelin, Nugent, that kind of stuff. You know, and her a lot of the same KTEL records and and all that kind of fun stuff, you know. Uh, I just became obsessed with guitar because, you know, I'd watch Midnight Special Mm -hmm. and I realized it was pretty young for a kid to be up at midnight, but I was, you know. It was the weekend. I could say as late as I wanted. It was uh, Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, Blue Jean Network, uh, all the, the rock magazines. I was just real interested at a young age. And the way I got into guitar was just, I was a radio freak, man. Uh, for some reason, one of the first things I remember really sticking out to me was was uh, Down in the Corner by Credence. Okay. And the sound of that opening, down, 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 you know that? Yeah, sure. And it, as much as I loved the song, I loved the sound of it. And then one of the next things I remember really loving the sound of was, you remember the, the distort, Tom Scholl's distortion sound on Don't Look Back? Sure. It was so unique. And it wasn't just another distorted guitar. Now, at that time, I didn't know what gain was. I didn't know what distortion was. But I knew I loved that sound. Right, right. <laughs> uh, just wanting to be able to make that beautiful noise was part of the whole reason I wanted to pick up a guitar, you know. Right, right. I had cousins who were older to play guitar and turned me on to a lot of music. But it was basically just, you know, between hearing everything on the radio that I thought was so neat wanted to be a part of, and then seeing something like Kiss or Jimmy Page and Ace or Jimmy holding the Les Paul, it just, it, it, I don't know why, it just became, I was like, you know, I think I might be able to do that. And, it, and it, you know, when you're that little, you don't know what you're going to do with it. You just know right. you want to do it, you know. Right, right. right. <laughs> so you get, a, you get a guitar at some point. So what happens with that? What's the first guitar? Yeah. Uh, 
I, I've always, Philip and I laugh about this a lot, Philip Schaus. I always, I did start at a young age, around 10. Okay. Okay. And uh, I inherited uh, an old acoustic, an Epiphone acoustic that was gotten from my mom for her birthday when she swore she was going to take lessons. But my mom and dad worked full time and my mom didn't have time to, to practice guitar. I think she took maybe two lessons and the guitar wound up in the closet. Right. And then I found it and uh, started playing it. They got, they, they, you know, set up lessons for me and I took them. I started taking them around 10. Right. Uh, and like I said, Philip and I joke, I always joke the first three years didn't take. <laughs> <laughs> so you're actually, this is about 79 or 80. You're, you're starting out. A little, yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, back in black at this time and just all this really cool stuff and even though i hadn't gotten very good at all yet i did convince my mom and dad to buy me a an electric guitar an electric guitar and amp it was a it was a les paul knockoff but it was black and it looked like aces les paul i think the company was called a bentley or something like that seriously i yeah. I, I can't remember. it was that in the backstage 30 <laughs> all right TV back 30 yeah and just you know Finally started learning a couple things here and there. And the minute I learned power chords, the whole world opened up for me. And uh, my mom found a different teacher for me that could kind of was up to speed and go kind of goes like, I know what this kid wants to do. Cause I was learning Mel Bay books at that point. You remember that stuff? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Me too. Exactly the same story. You know, started out with an acoustic didn't, didn't take. And then, and then I found a guy, you know, a guy like you're about to tell me about, I think. <laughs> yeah. The minute we sat down, and he goes, well, how long have you played? And just out of, well, you start a conversation. Long I remember hitting the bar chord. Uh, well, he goes, I got it. Okay. Because once he knew I could do that, and I used to take cassettes in, and he would teach me by ear, and I would watch him learn things by ear. Right. Let me learn how to pick things up by ear. So not only would I be able to do, leave there, learn, having something new he taught me, I would go home and try to copy and emulate what he was doing. Yeah. And that guitar more than anything was just teaching myself. And, uh, you know, yeah. I definitely do less than still. <laughs> but you know what? Don't you think from those less? I mean, what you just described, you know, we, I had this discussion with a lot of people who, who want their kids to learn guitar. Yeah. There's that thing you just said where you're there and you're observing him go about it, you know, whereas when we go online to learn it off somebody offline, you don't get that, that, give and take that happens with a person in a room you don't you know and there, that, that i think that's kind of double-edged because today let's rewind real quick to you and i mm -hmm. literally learning things off of a record and moving the needle or the cassette deck i mean how much did you go back and forth on your cassette deck with that rewind forward re, you know doing that thing right yeah and man there are so many millions of guitar videos out there today that just teach you you can go look immediately and go oh that's how you do it but the thing that you don't have is that interaction with somebody that goes, yeah, you're doing that, but here's why you're doing that. And this might be a little easier way to do that. And they would get the explanation with it. So sure. I think it's good and bad. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, we, I, I had said this many times in these videos um, that we, we didn't see, we couldn't see anybody physically play these parts. If you were learning Van Halen, you had to kind of like dig for a while to kind of even get it. You know, I, the first time I ever learned, uh, ain't talking about love. The teacher taught me it wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and you know, after all these, I'll show you real quick. What he did, he taught me this. Yeah. If you remember those the riff, everybody knows he plays it in first position, right? He's down here, right? He's down sure. like that. But he taught me like that. Okay. Cause we didn't know, you know, we didn't know where it was, but, that made it sound very staccato doing it that way, and that's kind of what it sounded like on the record, right? Yeah. Let me right. tell you what I... Yeah. A little out of tune, but that's all right. One yeah. of my first... I wanted to learn a whole lot of love. And it's right here. You know, he does that bent. Right, right. Okay. Me, I was going... Right, right, right. Right? And so... Well, I was my teacher looking at me and going, dude, Jimmy Page would never play that like that. <laughs> right. but, when, but, but you discover things while you do that. You know, when you, you yeah. screw up, you're discovering new, you know, not only ways to do it, but you're also discovering, like you did, where that other note is, at, you know, in relationship to the neck. And, 
Those Absolutely. Things, they help you. They don't. Yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. And I remember when I hit junior high school, that's when I really started meeting other people that played where I, you know, had instruments as well as it was different schools coming together as you got in junior high and high school. And man, there was nothing like getting in a room with one or two other guys with guitars and like, it's like exercising with somebody or playing a, you always, you have to rise your game up. Yeah. Right. And it's cool to see people that you're kind of on the same level with, but hopefully one's a little better than you so you can learn something. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing, having that give and take with someone was sitting with guitars is you just can't, you can't replace that. I don't think. Yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's one of the things that's, you know, I, like you said, there's a double-edged sword to the whole internet thing. Sure. We can just dial it up now. It's so easy. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Of but, course. But there was also that part, like you said, the interaction and um, and and discovering things along the way that you like you said with positions and whatever that didn't yeah. necessarily weren't right, but you learned other things from that. Yeah. The notes weren't wrong. You're, there's just a more uh, practical way of doing it. Or the Right, so, right. Or the way that he he did it, which we didn't know because we couldn't yeah. see until we went to the arena or down front, maybe we could catch it, you know, like that, you know, but the, I guess the, the other thing, you know, when you're, you're playing in those, like we said, talk, playing in those wrong positions, you know, you, you stumble across other things too. As, oh, you're, as you're trying to figure it out, you go, Oh, that's another song. And you start to pick <laughs> it up, you know, your ears start to, the ears oh, yeah. start to happen. So that's a big part. I think of why, if you just go and jump on a video and learn it, you're not you're not getting the ear training that we got. Like we were sitting down with somebody and they were and they were they were doing it by ear. So we were learning how they were doing that. Yeah. People ask me ask me about how do you you know how do you you know how do you pick up a song so quickly by ear? And they're always amazed by it. But I'm like, it's not once you've played enough riffs and enough songs, yeah. you start you start to recognize the same patterns, and then you just immediately well, can play it. You know. <laughs> That you become that you develop and more, come become more acute with over time just by the more you do it like anything you know yeah like singing harmony you know if you sing harmony in a band yeah. same thing yeah. it just takes time and, and effort it does. and you get really, you really really got to want to do it i mean and i think that that's a big thing where the inspiration like van halen and kiss came in you know they were like the the juice you know to get us to, to push us to 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 uh inspire us to go to the next level so for kiss when you what was the first time that you saw kiss Paul Lind Halloween special. Okay. I don't know if you know what that is. I yeah. think you do. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you don't, uh, and you, if there's someone out there who doesn't, in the 70s, uh, right around the time, well, actually, Destroyer was out. Kiss had just won on either side of the Paul Lind Halloween special um, a People's Choice Award for Best. So within a month or two period, I saw them, a video clip of them on the People's Choice Award, which completely blew my mind. And then... On the Paul Lynn Halloween special, they played Detroit Rock City, Bath, and King of the Nighttime World. Now, of course, they were all lip synced. Yeah. But those performances, I mean, it's just, it, it was just like nothing I'd ever seen before. And then you know how more, much more excited you get about stuff when you're a kid. You're much more impressionable. Sure. And to see something like Kiss that you never saw, I was used to seeing Leonard Skinner, man. And, um, you know, the flashiest thing I'd ever seen up to that point was uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, right. probably. Right. You know right. what I mean? It's and the dance moves and, you know, and seeing Kiss like that, it just blew my mind. And I know they were lip syncing, but that made it all even, I think, that much more exciting when you're little because it was all about performance. They were acting like they're playing, but they were playing to the camera. They weren't playing their instruments. They were playing to to us. Right, right. And to see that just was the coolest thing that I'd ever seen. And and it made my folks kind of just uh, not because <laughs> not because they're like, oh, rock and roll's terrible or whatever. It wasn't like that at all. My folks were were very very supportive, and they were not that parent that said, right, oh, it's bad and good. But the reason I think they shook their head is because it really is the only thing they heard about for the next 12 to 14 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel for my parents, too, because they've been, you know, dealing with this for, for their entire lives. <laughs> and it's, it's been a long, really, long time, long journey for all of us, right? You know, and, you know, like you said, we're very close to the age. I'm six, I was born in 68, so I'm only a year older than you. So okay. I went through everything. 
everything that you went through, you know, I even with Van Halen, you know, that the first uh, thing that I saw was Don Kirscher's rock concert. Oh man! When they did, when they showed the uh, eighty one videos, that was that's what got me going. You know, Unchanged. You know, I was like, wow, that is that's what I want to do right there. That's but that's uh, that's the Oakland footage, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, I had uh, exposed been exposed to Kiss. Saw Kiss in seventy nine on Dynasty tour. Oh wow! And um, so I had already knew about them, but I, something about Van Halen clicked for me. I think yeah. you know because Kiss was so theatrical. I didn't. Yep. I didn't see myself at, as much as I wanted to be Ace Freely. <laughs> I didn't see how I could be Ace Freely. You know, like they were this this thing, and you weren't going to be another one. So, um, so you go ahead. No, go ahead. I, so, I'm so, so when Van Halen came along, I, I it finally clicked for me. It was like, oh, this I can be this like this. I can do this, and I, and the show part of it was you know obviously insane to see it. Oh my. You know, and I had I had just heard of him, you know, through uh, friends when I was a kid. You know, we were doing BMX, and they were, were riding yeah. from some some race, and he was like, "This is Eddie Van Halen on on Beat It," and I I'm like, "Who's Eddie Van Halen?" You know, it Beat It. You know, of course that was big. That was '82, right? I think. So, you know, that was like you know I first heard him on the radio that solo, and that was it. Oh wow, yeah. But yeah, you know that that whole period that we went through with it before MTV, it just. Mm -hmm. You know, we had very limited, not sort of, not limited, but l different avenues to see live performances. Yeah. And uh, like you said, a lot often lip sync, but in Oakland it was live, of course. But yeah. But oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. So, so from, from the Kiss era for you, where do you jump off of Van Halen? Well, it was, uh, I had a cousin, an older cousin who was about seven years older than me. And, uh, you know, my mom's sister's son. And we spent a lot of time over there. Our family would go visit and whatever. And he always had the best album collection. I learned about a lot of stuff in his room. Pat Travers, Deep Purple, uh, you know, everything. And then Van Halen. All right. And I remember hearing Van Halen one in his bedroom. And he had vomit. And I just freaked out. And you know what? It was that, it was that horn that fade in the beginning of running with the devil mm -hmm. into that, into Mike's base mm -hmm. before the song even hurt start before the music even started before that, that rake that Ed does across the, I was, I was like, sign me up the horn and the bass. I was done. <laughs> I was just like, what, what is that noise? I mean, I don't know. It just, something in me clicked with that and then when the whole band kicked in forget it so i remember that christmas i got a small sony boom box with one speaker and a cassette deck in it and one of the cassettes that i got was man I own one right and talk about bmx bike if i was on my bike that little boom box with the man Halen cassette was with me i walked to school with it i walked home from school with it i rode my bike with it that thing i wore it out i just wore Every song I absolutely loved. And there was, as much as I loved Edward, and, you know, he is my favorite guitar player. I can't play anything like him, and I'm never going to be able to. Um, you know, that's a big understatement. And I just love him. I love his songwriting. I love his smile. I love his energy on stage. I love all of it. But, man, there was something about Dave that I just completely clicked with. Yeah. And I don't want to be misquoted here or anything by saying that I think I'm Dave or whatever. <laughs> and he is my hero, front man of all front men. But again, I'd look at Edward and knew I never had a chance, but I would watch Dave. And again, you just kind of go, yeah, I, I might be able to do that. And again, I'm not saying that, I, but it's just something. It's just a feeling you get. That's why I feel like I got so connected with that band because of the songs and Dave's just his whatever it was, man. I was in tune with it. Yeah, I think we all, I mean, with Roth, you know, when I first saw him, it was uh, that Jim Ladd interview prior to the, the videos, you know. And so uh, that was my very first moment to see Roth. That was on his back porch, right? Yeah, yeah, at his house, yeah. And, He's in the director's 
wearing the riding pants and the riding boots. Yeah, man, I've watched that a million times. You're right. So uh, that was my first v- vision of that's that's the first time I ever saw David Lee Roth, and oh, this is before the videos came on. You know, so I'm 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 already going. Who is this guy, and what is his deal? <laughs> Because you know how he is, right? So I was just I was just locked in on him, you know, and and then the video started, and that was that was it, you know. But uh, yeah, Roth has always been, uh, you know, for people who didn't grow up with him in that earlier era, um, they don't understand his his thing, you know. They, they I think for you and I to sit here to try to explain it to someone who'd never seen it, I feel like personally I would only cheapen it, right. But trying to explain it, and I can tell you, and I, I'm sure the same as with you, I've been real fortunate to see some of the premier bands on the planet yeah. live in every genre. Uh, the only people I, I wasn't able to see Zeppelin, you know, I saw him after, but the, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't see the Who with Moon, but aside from that, I feel like you know we've been real fortunate to see some of the most talented, awesome, biggest mans in the world. That being said, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I personally watched Dave in person do this, and you see it on video, 18,000 people. Dave could just go stand at the front of the stage and smile for, for two minutes and not say a word. Yep. And the entire 18,000 seats would just erupt and be crazier than any event you've ever been to. And I've seen guys work really hard and say a lot to get that reaction. And Dave could just go stand in one spot yep. and just do that thing that he did. And people picked up on it. There was, there was something that there was that, there's an, un, there's an untangible with that, with him. And like we, you said, or, you know, especially from 78 through 81, 82, there was, there was a, that, magnet magnetic thing by 84 they're this monster you know yeah. when i when i first saw them in 84 when, when i was 16 you know they were a monster uh, oh yeah at that point so i i kind of missed the raw you know thing yeah. that i hear from people like damon or or some of the people that saw him early on mike simmons was on here from blackbird and he, he saw him in 78 so the stories they tell me i mean you know life-changing moments with this band and and so what, what happens where's your first exposure to them live uh how'd you sheep what was it the how'd you sheep tour okay 82 so that, yep kansas city uh camper arena whenever they came through kansas city once they began headlining it was always camper arena that's the only place they played with david lee ross they didn't go to municipal they didn't go to an outdoor it was always there mm-hmm. uh, I also saw 84 back to back. Two nights in a row, they did Kemper Arena. So I got to see both nights there. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, man, like I said, you just can't, ex- I, I just can't explain anything besides it just being so incredibly exciting and amazing. The energy those guys had. And, you know, we called it Smile Rock. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, to me, that's what California sounded like in my brain. Right, right, right. Growing up in Kansas, I'm like, if I ever get to California and I turn on the radio and I'm driving down, I picture driving along the beach or something, man. I thought this is what this is what California is going to sound like. Yeah, I think I think you're you know you're right. That is something that was it, it was embodied in their music, even though we, I think we you know we all knew they were from California, but yeah. that's that's what we that's how we imp- it was imprinted on us. This was California's like this is the sound of California, yeah. right? And that was about you know their vocals. God, they sang so well together. Right, right. You know, especially especially uh, Mike and Ed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know the harmony. And, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. And uh, it's just, I'll just never forget it. It was just some of the most exciting shows that I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. It was crazy. Uh, I particularly enjoyed Hide Your Sheep a little more mm-hmm. because, uh, uh, listen, I'm a bigger is better guy when it comes to, to shows because I like to see it all. Right, right. It was a lot more grandiose by the time it got to 84, meaning. I'm not exaggerating. Second or third song was already the drum solo. Right, right. Um, started. Right, right. You know, every guy had his own solo. Is the word that wouldn't happen during Hide Your Sheep. Right, right. 
and it was more was there, so there was more music and there was more songs but Dave was still doing his thing and they looked like they were having a great time uh, it, it was more self-indulgent musically and spotlight wise listen we know they were self-indulgent in every way <laughs> right, right 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 but but uh but that stage show you know is probably one of the biggest i mean most incredible <laughs> stage shows ever of all time amazing right it, it i still see shots of it today that'll pop up on a news feed somewhere yeah it really is one of the biggest it looks like because you know the stone shows and stadiums are just cities right right it's like an arena version of that oh yeah yeah it's you know and i i i loved and this is something about that I want to get into with some folks that, that maybe did this was the backdrops, all of the, uh, you know, how they integrated all the, you know, Pete Angelus did all this art direction where they put all these great backdrops that blended the stage. You know, now we do it with the LED screens or whatever, but yeah. back then they did it with theatrical drops, you know, and, and that the way that that was built into 84 and just, you know, into hide your sheep in 82, yeah. 81, of course, with that backdrop and, and multiple. Yeah. You know, now we see what Iron Maiden will do. They'll do they do physical backdrops still, it's and they do like ten of them. You know, <laughs> they'll do it all for, you know songs. It feels like they change on every song. Yeah, right. It's but it's, it's still a really cool and effective tool. It's and amazing. It's it really. You know what's funny is uh, I remember Motley Crue's Theater of Pain. They did a really good job of that. I remember them them using that technique a lot, and that looked really great. But just going real quick. Uh, as far as Maiden does, I mean, their production is just insane with the, the B2 Bomber and Eddie and the whole deal. That's great. But you know what, man? As far as it goes, backdrops look so great and can be so effective. In the big scheme of things, backdrops don't cost that much. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the huge LED thing that goes on all the time now and everything and costs the millions of dollars to do, I prefer the maiden approach to change the backdrops every time. It's just something cooler about it to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a theat the theatrical. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, you and me from, <laughs> we just love that. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I don't, you know, we're kiss, you know, in the early days, the, you know, we just were, at least for me, I was obsessed with the sign, right? <laughs> you know, just the visual of that. It was just, you know, and then and then Van Halen came out with their thing, with their sign. And, and there's these huge, these huge production pieces that, that you know, when we were kids, these were just unbelievably huge things to see. Yeah. And now LED screens are so, you know, ubiquitous that everybody just expects sure. it. And you know what the thing is, uh, um, the people that are in our age group, and here comes the old guy, uh, I think people today, are there, there's there have seen everything the whole i've seen it all yeah you know, just because of the way technology is man when you saw that kiss alive 2 love gun stage there had never been anything like that in the world before oh yeah right all the original destroyer stage with the castle for gene and the especially in the frankenstein the original lightning bolt machine from frankenstein that never made it to the rest of the shows but my point being, stuff like that, this was a first. It's to where when people do stuff today, have they really not seen it before? It might be impressive, but you can't say, oh, I've never seen anybody do that. It's like it, we were lucky because we actually got to see stuff done for the first time. Right, right. I agree. Yeah. And, and you, we had less, re they had less resources. They didn't have these things. So they had to come oh. up with something, something. Yeah. That carry around in a truck and, and, and assemble and, and you know you know like you're talking about that stage with the with the lot with the, the frankenstein thing i've only seen a few pictures of that thing yeah i i never got to see that in in person in its actuality but like i said the point being that someone was ambitious enough to actually try that <laughs> right, right right you know and gene's blood was always you know one of the big big things right when we were kids yeah. it's like you know the, the, the place are this fit fire and blood <laughs> <laughs> right we, i mean we, that is something that you know think about before that you know before that you just kiss just was so transformative in the in the show aspect of it that that i think it, it resonates today you know even you know with some of these okay. bands that are out there there's a band i'm not sure how well you know ghost but uh, oh yeah yeah uh, i just feel like they're kind of a throwback to that a little bit they yep. they they, they, I, uh, they follow some of the backdrop th ideas and some of the show ideas and and a lot of the production is very similar to what we, we grew up on 
Yeah, something I enjoyed about one of the ghost sets that I saw was a backdrop, and it looked like uh, stained glass. With, yeah, windows, yeah. Stairs that came down. It reminded me very much of the Diary of a Madman stage set, yeah. which I love. That is a throwback, you know? Right, right, definitely, for sure. So, you know, on the Van Halen thing, you know, what, yeah. you, just let ask you a couple of questions about their songs and, and, and the albums, sure. just little you know obviously we always want to find out what your favorite favorite stuff is on those so you yeah. if you had to pick one two albums let's pick two out of the entire catalog okay which i'm one? always i'm always going to start with the first album right it is still my favorite van halen record okay uh the other one man i hate to be wishy-washy on it but it depends on what week it is <laughs> right right <laughs> it's a lot like I'll get stuck. Like my most recent one I got stuck on for a long time was Fair Warning. Yeah. And I couldn't quit listening to Fair Warning. Uh, you know, the second record, I went absolutely nuts over when I was a kid because it danced the night away. I mean, that is just still one of my favorite all-time Van Halen songs. And you know what's crazy about that one? There's not a solo in it. No, right. Just a tapping. And this is from the greatest guitar player in the world. How do we have a song that I love so much by this man? There's no guitar solo in it. Right, right. right. Uh, and I'm sorry. Like I said, the first one's always going to be my favorite record. The second one changes all the time. I will tell you something that might surprise you. It might not. Go ahead. Uh, a second all the time for me is Diver Down. I know the band would kick me out of the fan club for probably saying that. Right, right. Because that's their least favorite record. I understand it was a time when they were kind of at odds with the record company and each other and the fact that there are covers on it. But man, I feel like that's some of Dave's best vocals. Mm -hmm. I agree. The original stuff on there, I am just absolutely insane about. I absolutely love it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what's funny is I had to sit down and learn. I have never learned it, but I had to learn uh, Dancing in the Streets. Last oh. Last night, because I've never, I've never learned it, and I and uh, I haven't either. And, and I had to learn a little delay, the little delay pattern thing, and you know, it, it's actually pretty easy. But but you know, you try to get your head around at first. It's like you know, and you watch the videos of them doing it live. You know, that was like there was a keyboard in the original version of that. Yeah. But, but then there, but then live, he would do it with the echo. And yeah. Um, yeah, you know, and and then the Struts had redone that song recently, and if you listen to their version of it, they they use exactly that same sound and, the, and that same. Oh, really? Yeah, it's it's really. Oh. Cool. <laughs> Wolfgang even called them out on it. It was like, <laughs> yeah, like this is too much like my dad's version. <laughs> oh no way! Yeah, he did. He did put something up about you know. Oh boy, I, I'm definitely gonna look. I'm definitely gonna look that up after we're done here because I've not heard that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. You know. Yeah. That, you know go ahead. Sang his tail off on that record. It was just oh, he sang so great. Oh yeah, you know the full bug. <laughs> I mean, dude, there's so many cool oh, riffs. God. I mean, just all that stuff. He's just so good. And the playing, uh, Ed's playing on it. And then, you know, I had this talk with, with Greg Renoff about this album because um, Greg and I were talking about these tracks, you know. Yeah. Big Bad Bill, you know, how it's just, it's just like those tracks mo blow your mind when you hear them. You know, oh, I mean, like, I'm a kid and I'm still, I'm blown away by this, 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 you know, almost jazz. Yep. Thing, right. And and then, you know, there's there's other examples of songs like that, like on Women's Children First or or wherever, where they they stretch and do these things, you know, with like happy trails with the harmony, you know. Yeah. They're all yeah. different things, man. It was so interesting to listen to. Oh, it so was. And you know, one of the things going back to and and this isn't to take away from like I said, I didn't mention any of the records, but I it it really does change all the time as I get I love all the albums so much, like I'll just get stuck on women and children. And you know, for a month period, and that's all I listen to when I'm running or whatever. I right. love those records so much, but I just have to adjust one thing real quick because mm -hmm. dance. I mean, uh, dance the night away is a really good example. Uh, people always talked about. Now, listen, I know Dave took a lot of creative liberties live with words here and there, and he was jumping or he was whatever and doing his thing, and he he definitely was very free with skipping words and changing things up mm -hmm. as a vocalist though 
for I think it's really unfair when he gets discredited as not being a very good singer because if you listen to him sing Dance the Night Away just as, as one of the songs for an example, mm-hmm. to, that is a fantastic version of a really great singer. It's distinctive. It's got character, that throaty thing he had. He hits the notes. He does stuff on other guys do. I think Dave was a great singer. I, I really you probably, you know, like me, you probably listen to the isolated tracks and all the time. You know, and, and there was so little capability to you know do line by line overdubs or whatever back right. then. So you know he was singing this stuff. And um you yeah, you know, I think it's the tone, like you said, that there's a he had a great tone. He did. Yeah, the timbre voice was unmatched. It was just, you know, it, it, was he the the best singer in rock? I think it's debatable. Yeah. You know, you don't, nobody's right. It's okay for everybody to have different opinions of who the best is or their favorite is, you know? Sure. Uh, but he's definitely one of my favorite, always will be. Well, you know, there is, there's a parallel between him and Gene that, that you probably know and I, and I kind of sure. know. Gene Simmons obviously was part of their, their you know, first demos and we know about the demos that, that he helped produce but um those guys had a work ethic dave and gene that that and a vision you know visionary yeah. i, I want to think about stuff that i want to do in in whatever i'm working on you got to mm-hmm. have some sort of long-term vision and gene obviously had that for kiss and and dave had that for van halen and I think that's one thing that people don't know about Dave is how much how much he had to work at being a great singer, and then oh, yeah. and how much of the vision that that he brought forth. You know, obviously Pete Angelus was involved in a lot of the yeah. stuff that we saw, but you know, it takes that kind of person. You know, I think that Eddie was you know he was the really creative musician guy. You know. Yeah. They had those different aspects, but they all had their strengths. And, you know, I think Van Halen was that thing where, like Kiss, they, they had their different personalities that added up to this whole. And yeah. With Dave, he was the visionary. He was the, the, the work ethic guy, the guy who, you know, was going to get things done. Yeah. And you know what? Um, I, I agree with you a million percent on the work ethic and the vision and everything. You know, Eddie was absolutely the the songwriting force behind that band sure right right i totally get that uh but dave you know those lyrics were all his sure you talk in the melody you know melody wise you know who knows ed may have said this is the melody and there might have been a guitar melody on the thing this is the melody for the song great whatever that's fantastic i believe that because it's it's that good but i know dave came up with a lot of them too but the thing that's so cool about dave was he was so well, well read his entire life yeah. and so turned on or in tune with so many different types of music. You hear about him growing up in being the only white kid in an all black and Mexican school mm-hmm. and nothing but Ohio players, earth, wind, and fire, and all that kind of stuff. Cool the gang, which he's doing, and he's reading Mark Twain at the same time. It's like, that's what the guy got that gift to gab. You yeah. know, that's and the word, that's where the wordsmith came from that is that guy, I think. Yeah, I think that you you know you're touching on something that that I've talked to many people about with Dave, and this is one of the amazing things about Dave, is that when you listen to something, I, and this is funny because I just started really trying to do, trying to take Van Halen three back in again, because <laughs> right. I, I interviewed Chris Gill from Guitar World, a guitar player, and he suggested that I should listen to it and forget about the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I did was I, I listened to it and I started to think about what David Lee Roth would have sang over this, you know. Yeah. And, and when I think about it in that context, I think it would have been a totally different deal. I mean, they probably would have been, had a, had a you know, very successful album because Edward was still being Edward. It wasn't really any changes there. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, man, Roth could sing over anything that Eddie played, and some of those things were so crazy. Yeah. You know that. <laughs> It blew me away. It, it blew me away too. And the thing is, is uh, as much as we all know um, from people that you know within the Van Halen camp, and just from what you read, it's no secret they drove each other crazy. Oh yeah, right. I get that, man. That was part of it, though. Yeah, right. It was. It was that uh, that, that friction or whatever you want to call it came out on tape. 
and on vinyl because it's kind of what created that sound, you know? Yeah. Uh, right. We'll just, we'll never hear that again. That's right. You know, but, uh, the good news is we will because we will have those records forever. That's true. That's true. You know, thinking about like Unchained, when they're, oh. when they're breaking through those little, you know, the pre-chorus of that song, you know, how does he come up with these lyrics and how does he come up with these melodies? They're just so unique. Yeah. You know, and that, I, that that's, you know, not only his voice is he underestimated, we know about his showmanship. It's one of the greatest of all time. But yeah. just his ability to come up with these crafty melodies that stick with you, you know. Uh, people gave gave him a lot of crap or gave Van Halen a lot of crap for Tattoo when it came out in yeah. 2012. But for me, it was it was... It was David Lee Roth as always. It was no difference. It was all you know. It's one of those things that I think I, I ran across this recently. I just found a new song from Brian Adams, and it started. Oh. After, I started to think to myself, why isn't Brian? And maybe he's, he's huge in like Europe or Portugal and Spain, and does these massive shows. But what is it about what's changed in our in our music listening that 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 doesn't allow Brian Adams to have another hit? And right. it's just, I think when we grew up, you know, we, we got exposed to these songs over and over and over through MTV yep. and they grew on us, you know, they, they had some time to settle with us like Tattoo, yep. once you listen to Tattoo a few times, it feels like, oh, well, this is exactly like it felt back then to me. Yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah I agree with that. And I also think we, we uh, grew up listening to music in a time when there were there was less music out there okay and there were definitely less platforms to have music played on there was no streaming there was this is even before mtv right right there was, there was no youtube there was no any of that uh point being though we grew up in a time when record labels would invest in a band meaning we're going to put this record out and we're at least going to see this band through three records. And hopefully that each record is going to sell better than the last. We're going to watch this band grow and develop their talent along, along with that, even though there was payola and all that, they made sure that we heard that song over and over on the radio. And as a point now stuff gets tested and they let, they let bands make put out a song now before they decide to let them finish the record. They have to see how that song does. It's such a, a machine now of, not nurturing bands, hit it or quit it. You know, right, right. If in immediate action, we're not going to move on with you. Yeah, and I think that's why we heard music so much more. Like you said, it got ingrained in our brains. Uh, we didn't have a choice but to hear that stuff because all we listened to was FM radio, maybe some AM, right. but always radio, and they were getting the same playlist that ca crosses the country in each format. So, you know, you and I had cuts like a knife ingrained in our brain for a long time. Sure, sure, yeah. And and when I listen to those songs, I think, yeah, this song could have been one of those songs. It just needed it needs like I, I was trying to sell my band on doing a cover of one that's never been what's well, just been released. Trying okay. to sell them on a cover that, that that nobody's heard the song though, really. Not in America. Yeah. Right? Okay. I thought it'd be a crafty thing to like cover this before anybody even knew about it. Probably will never know about it because yeah. it's just the way it is. But but you know what's hard to sell to somebody is the fact that they've only heard it unless they sit like me and listen to it three times, four times, five times. It, it's hard to see the vision of what I'm trying to do there. You know, like, I, like I'm trying to sell this to somebody, and yeah, uh, yeah. So it's you. It, it, but they can't help it because this is just the way you do music these days. You know, you don't, I mean, I still sit there and listen to the new Scorpions track 20 times in a row, but, but, you know, cause I'm trying, I'm trying to absorb it, trying to, to, to yep. really feel that song. And uh, I mean, we just don't do that. I will tell you, I feel really fortunate that that still is not lost on me. Even at 52 years old, uh, I am still a fan. Yeah. With the, I treat new music. Uh, I would say it's really close to the same way as I did when I got it when I was a kid. Yeah, you just I know when something's coming out. I anticipate it coming out. I get it when it comes out, and it's something that I'll just play to death. Right. You know. Right. Right. For sure. So let's talk about your 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 ma your magical story. <laughs> now you just kind of give me a little background. Like you were in Kansas City, you said, right? Okay. <laughs> I grew up in. Tepe which is the capital of Kansas, uh, 60 miles from Kansas City. Okay. So growing up, 
we didn't have like a major arena in my hometown of Topeka until I was a sophomore high school. So that being said, I spent most of my life driving, getting driven to or driving to Kansas City to see all the concerts. Right, right. So as a musician, though, where did you start playing? And you had a band, obviously. And, and we all- I was like every other kid in the Midwest and the rest of the country and the world. Started, uh, once I got in junior high, I started being in bands, which developed into cover bands, which developed into me working and playing around playing covers. Right. Everything from Brian Adams to Motley Crue. Okay. Right. Uh, I eventually made my way to L.A., I was in Nashville for a minute, got moved to L.A., and uh, I ended up getting a record deal with a band called Hair of the Dog. Uh, we did three albums and had the privilege of, of touring the world, getting on the radio, doing the whole thing. It never made it to the level I wanted to, but I did get signed and get to make, uh, make a living at music, which was great. Even did some shows with Dave. I mean, we toured with everybody. What, year, our- what, what year is this? Your- okay. I got to now, uh, L.A. late 92. Okay. Okay. Uh, it took a couple of years because I, I got moved out there by a guy named Desmond Child who was working with a band. Of course. And uh, met, ended up working with these guys. By the time we got there, or when I did get there, uh, we needed to be a band, like learn how to write songs. You know, really learn what we were doing, like try to learn it because most of what we were doing wasn't good enough yet. But anyway, we got a new drummer. Did that whole deal. I did do tour with, uh, record tour with Hair Dog, like I said, for three albums. And the band broke up right around 2000, late 2000, 2001. But in that time, we toured the world. We got, we toured a ton. So from 93, 2000, late 2000, 2001, I was in that band. Mm -hmm. And part of the fun of being in LA and being in a band is that you meet everybody. You know, you, you find out how small the music world really is. And once you start getting in the magazines and stuff like we did and touring a lot, you get you start getting the opportunity to meet a lot of these people. Sure. And, uh, you know, one of the real fun things you'll like is one of my really good friends became Niels Lozauer. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love him. Who I'm still really good friends with to this day. My first professional photo shoot with Hair the Dog was with Niels Lozauer in his studio. <laughs> All right. And if you were down here in my basement, you would see I have Lozauer prints everywhere because every year on my birthday, he would give me a different print. So I've got all kinds of cool stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> Man, stuff yeah. And everything. But uh, so I was in LA for a long time in Southern California on Ventura Boulevard is where I lived. <laughs> and, uh, Lowe's and I would, when I wasn't sure, we'd take the chip, chips to Vegas with Dave and have all kinds of fun and do, it every, do everything. So living in LA was just, was, was great. It was just amazing. So, you met Roth through Lowe's? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, because he was close to them, obviously, in the early days. And, and Oh, he worked with them. He was their touring photographer for a long time. Right. And so, I mean, your experience with Roth is what? I mean, yeah. I mean he was always nice to us. Uh, it, it, we had to be around him for a long time for we like I would be in the same proximity as proximity as him for a long time, but it took about a few weeks of me in that proximity to actually get to meet him. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. Uh, some of the most fun I had with him though was when uh, Zlo's was was really close with him, and the most time I started spending around those guys was when Dave was doing that Dave's barbecue thing where he was with the Dom triplets. You remember that? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember that. And they spent uh, a long time at Henson A&M Studios right there on La Brea across from pr- Crazy Girls. Okay. Going there and be filming just all this crazy stuff. With, with I mean, it was it was insane, right. you know? And Dave was still making that little film, that movie, but then he would go to Vegas to do a few shows and we would tag along and go just have a great time with them. And that's also during the time of the same uh, Dave and Sammy tour. I, I saw that tour in Nashville. Oh, you did? Okay. The first time I I saw Universal Amphitheater in Studio City, Universal City. Okay. And uh, it was just fun to spend a lot of time with him. It was exactly what you'd be like, expect hanging around Dave. Yeah. Whatever he would be like, it was like that. (laughs) So so did you ever get to ask him questions that you wanted to ask him about the early days or anything like that? We didn't talk about the early days. We always just would shoot the shit about whatever. It was like, yeah, it would be it would be Neil 
instigating the conversation. I never got the nerve to go. So what was it like with, with right. on fair, uh, partially because I never felt like I had the op- right opportunity, but also because what if it pissed him off? Right, right, right. What if right. he didn't talk about it? Right, yeah, right. <laughs> so lucky to be there and to be having such a great time and actually really being able to hang out right. in that world. I wasn't going to bring up Ed or Al. Right, right, right. That'd be a disaster. Yeah, but you know, too, too, we were we were not looking back as much at that point. You know, like we do today. But I will tell you, I, I felt like I still feel okay with my decision about not bringing them up because everything that you read, they would be like, I don't know what they're doing over there on Howdy Doody Hill when he was talking about that. You know, so there was always a little bit of a dig. And I felt like obviously there was still some bad blood there, so I was like, "I'm not, I'm not going to." You're not going there. <laughs> You're not going there. <laughs> Let's go. Cool. If, if I would have hung out with Eddie or Al, I wouldn't have brought up Dave. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, your woods lows, and and I guess you, this is we got to get into this story. Oh yeah. Um, I assume this has to do with Eddie. <laughs> it does. Well, here's what happened. All right. So, the hair of the dog broke up. And fortunately for me and everybody involved, it was amicable. It was one of the few times that a band breaks up and they're all still friends. But we had, we had hit the end of the road after only three records. Uh, it just wasn't happening anymore. And it kind of got to the point where it didn't, you could, it didn't feel like it was happening. And we were all such good buddies that we were just like, let's call this a day. And we did. So I remained in L.A. And I just spent a lot. The bass player and I lived together from here the dog and i just had the best time ever because i wasn't i wasn't working i was running around and i was always you know, every time i was running around just going out with my friends i was wondering what am i going to do next right I play just guitar for someone am i going to sing and play guitar for someone what am i doing and i'm still hanging around all the same everybody i hung out with was music industry people okay it was it was people that that you know and everybody is aware of it was that circle so yeah. I was always, I was always like, what's going on? What's going on here and there? Mm-hmm. Part of the thing that we all knew at the time was the Van Halen didn't have a singer. Right. Okay. So I lived at the corner of Ventura and Vineland in the middle of studio city. Okay. I don't have a gig. I'm still not sure what I'm doing. It's a Sunday afternoon. I go to pump gas at the 76 station at the corner of Ventura and Vineland. Right. Mm-hmm. just as I pull up, I just gone running. So I was in my running shorts and stuff and it was Sunday afternoon. And I said, that I need gas. I'm going to go over and fill up my truck. A white Mercedes pulls up on the other side of the, the gas pump from me. Who, who gets out? <laughs> Ed. <laughs> it's Edward. Right. And I'm like, I'm just like, it's in my head, I'm like, oh my God. Like, oh my God. And he gets out. And he gets the pump gas, and he looked right at me. And ran, and I kind of have to set up the situation. I'm in running shorts. That's it. The running shorts are running shoes. I didn't have a shirt on. I just, <laughs> no, it wasn't going anywhere. I was pumping gas and going home. Right. And he looked at me kind of just like, you know, not like he was checking me out, but he kind of made eye contact as he was getting gas. And I go, Ed. And he goes, I go, God, I love you, man. And that was, I mean, it's the stupidest thing to say. <laughs> I say that he's like, oh, thanks, man, and, and we start talking as he's pumping gas, and I had just been with Lowe's the night before, so I used that as right. like, hey, I go small world. I was just with Lowe's last night. I go, we were at such and such this restaurant in his Lowe's. And I was like, oh, God, Lowe's, yeah, you know, I haven't seen him in a long time, and we're just really having a friendly chat and whatever. And I finally just said it. I go, sorry. Have you found a singer yet? I know you guys are looking for a singer. No, not yet, man. We haven't found. I go, I know a guy. He's like, who? And I go, me. <laughs> and he literally looked and he goes, you got anything on you? And I didn't. Right, right. I didn't have anything on me. And here's where it gets completely crazy insane. Okay. I keep telling you where it was, the corner of insurance and violin, because it's important to the story. So he goes, you got anything? Like, you got a CD? And I go, no, but I live right there. 
and you could see my building. Like if I was like, it was a really good throw. I could have hit the building with a tennis ball. That's how close we were. Right. I go, no, but I live right there and I have something there. And he goes, all right. So I get done pumping gas. I wait for Ed. I drive out the little side street. Ed follows me to my house. <laughs> and God is my witness. All I could think as we were driving off was I'm going to look in the rear view mirror and see him just <laughs> right. take off. He didn't. I parked on the curb right in front of my apartment building. I got out and waited and Ed pulled up and parked right behind me. And this is before cell phones. This is before anything. Right. And all I stood there thinking was, God, please, somebody drive by who knows me. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 And nobody did. And got, <laughs> we went in the lobby and got on the elevator and went up to my floor. Man, he came in my apartment and, you know, he walks in and just walked over and sat right on my couch. And as he was sitting on the couch, there's a, a, a big, giant, black and white framed print from Zlo's. And it's of him and it's of him and Dave at Sunset Sound. Oh, wow. And this road case. And Dave's looking back at Ed like this, you know? And the Ed, the Ed's playing like a little mandolin kind of thing. Right, right. And he's like, wow, that was a long time ago. And, <laughs> and he sits down and picks up this Les Paul Custom, which was leaning against the couch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he starts playing it. And just noodling, and we're talking. He lights up a cigarette, right? Yeah. And he's telling me about Wolfie, and Wolfie had to be really little at this point. He's like, oh, my God, he's a kid, can play everything already. He sings like a bird. Sounds like Michael Jackson. Right, right. You know, he's about his kid and all this, and, and we're just talking. And then I remember he goes, uh, as he lit a cigarette, he's like, you know, I got tongue cancer. I go, I, I, I go, oh, man. And I go, I didn't know that. And I go, no, I didn't. He goes, yeah, he goes, it's, he goes, it's fucked up. He goes, they had to remove part of my tongue, you know, to cut it out. He's people hear me talk and think I'm fucked up and I'm drunk again. He's, but I'm not. It's because they removed part of my tongue. Right, right. Telling me all this. And it's just a lot to take. I mean, it's a lot. It's like, right. I'm so, <laughs> so, so finally, hey, man, he goes, play me something. He's holding my guitar the whole time, just, you know. So I, I put a CD in and I started to play it and I'm, Gas this so he, he goes, No, 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 turn it down, man. Turn it down. <laughs> like it was too loud. <laughs> really? <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> turn it down, man. Because that's not and, what I've heard about him. <laughs> well, at least at 5150, he was. I know it. Yeah. But he was and he was like really leaning in. He's he's like, Oh yeah, that's good. That's good, man. He's like, Yeah. And then he goes, uh, well, look, I'll give you my number. And I went and all I had was a people magazine sitting on the the table over there. Ed wrote his number. On the uh, magazine, mm -hmm. he goes, well, look, he goes, he goes, he goes I'm going to take this. He goes, give me a call. You know, give me a call this week. And this was a Sunday afternoon. Okay. And, uh, man, I, to my credit, I really kept it together. Right, right. <laughs> he didn't tell me no. He gave me his number. And he said, call him. And we just kind of shot, shot the ship for a little bit more. Five minutes or so more the whole thing probably took about 25 30 minutes it was that long that we it was a long time for me right. anyway right 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 and we left and i walked him back downstairs to his car and walked him out to the street where he was parked and he's like well hey well thanks man and he gave me a hug and I just, say, yeah. I say, did he kiss you <laughs> he didn't kiss me oh, <laughs> I just watched him get in his car and, and drive off. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> I mean, it, it literally, I, I can't tell you, I, I was so starstruck. Right. I was just so starstruck. And I didn't have a cell phone. They, no one really did at that point. All right. And I ran upstairs and called the few closest friends that are closest to me. Nobody picked up, and I just incessantly kept calling. You're not going to believe me. <laughs> you know? Right. And, you know, what a guy. 
that would literally, I mean, I could have knocked him on the head and kidnapped him once he got in my apartment. Who knows? Right, right. And say yes on that particular day to actually do that. You know, uh, I felt like a girl or a guy, like, you know, they always joke when you're a kid, like, oh, after the first day, don't call, don't call too soon. You got to wait a couple of days. Right, right, right. <laughs> I waited till Wednesday to call him because he's <laughs> next week, put him in tomorrow. <laughs> You know, uh, I did call. He did pick up. And I said, he goes, hey, man. He goes, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, look, man, your voice is great. You sound great. It's just not what I'm hearing for what, what I'm doing. It's just, and I was like, fair enough. You know, right. he followed through. He didn't blow me off. Right. He, he didn't, like, you know, string me along or anything like that it, he could have written a fake number down shit it could have been anything right right and i was never i never auditioned with them i was never considered to be the singer for them that's as far as it went but it was just like what a as much as i loved ed i loved him that much more after that because he did not have to do any of that right right and you know, there are a couple guys, Sean Colligan and John Sapetis, who are like two of my really close friends. They are two of the guys that did pick up the phone that day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, actually, John called me back. He's like, what? Because he's because I, I called like 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't <leave> a message. <laughs> right. But but John and Sean uh, did talk to me within the hour. Finally, after that happened, you know, and uh, it was just tremendous i mean even today i haven't talked about it in about a year right uh and it just I, I still can't believe it i can't i really can't so did you have any more interactions with him after that or that was it no. that was no no nope. yeah. that would have been the sharon right before sharon became the singer was it because see uh, it's, late, it's late 90s i remember being on tour with hair the dog and i remember our guitar player john Picking that record up, he got like a special advanced copy in a tin that had a few things in it, like a mobile. I feel like I was after. I feel like this was after Gary. Okay, might have been because because Hair of the Dog was done, and I remember John getting Van Halen three when we were on tour. Okay, so it'd have been after that, yeah. So I'm pretty sure this was after the whole Gary thing, right? After Van Halen three, okay. they had not gotten back together with Sam yet. Yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. That, they had gone back and forth, and it was a yeah. They, they, it was a big area there that you know. Uh, 